into that. Uh, without further ado, let me have uh, each one speak about their program a little bit, a little bit of details. And if you would also mention what was the spark? What got it started? Because our attendees here are either exploring programs or maybe starting one themselves and they would love to learn it. I would know I would as well. So uh, Tim, how about we start with you? You wanna speak to uh, what TCALC is and then what was the spark for that creation? Sure, thank you, Greg, and welcome everyone. Uh, TCALC, Topeka Center for Advanced Learning and Careers actually was the brainchild of our Board of Education about, oh, now eight or nine years ago. And this happened after they visited uh, the Blue Valley program where Greg is located, of course. And they thought, what can we do in Topeka for our students so they have these opportunities? And they were looking specifically at how they can, quote, grow their own and have students remain in the community and how they can work better with their business and industry partners. And so that's how TCOP was born. Uh, it was that vision. And so now we currently have nine different, what we call pathways for students to, uh, to explore. And uh, it's been a phenomenal success. We have right now uh, increased our enrollment every year since beginning. This will be our fourth year. And uh, we opened the program four years ago. I was fortunate enough to be the, the first principal and absolutely love it. So we'll talk more about it as we go on, but it's just a, a great place to be. Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, also, uh, Greg, Chris, you can care to share with your program and then what was the spark for your Excel? Uh, Excel's in its first year. Um, our our director of innovation, Kurt Mould, came from a district where um, Dr. Hall had started and got it up and running. And then he wanted to bring it to the Sun Prairie School District. Sun Prairie is the second fastest growing city um, in the state of Wisconsin and wanted to offer more to our students. Um, so we started off with just global food and sustainability and our global business academies. And then from there, uh, when our schools split from one high school to two high schools next year, per our growth, uh, we're expanding into to three more. So it started as a slow roll and then COVID. Um, so we essentially got a, a beta test year last year where we got to do it the COVID way. And now our teachers are so excited to have their students in class, especially in that global food sustainability where they're growing uh, their own products, understanding how all that works. So um, it was a multiple year rollout for us, um, but it's going really well and it's really taken hold in the community for us. Um, so that's, that's how it got up and started and we're continuing to grow. Craig, thank you. So glad to have you here. Teresa, how about you? Tell us the great story of your school and what was the spark for that? And so exciting to hear about this. Well, good morning. Thanks, Greg. And I'm super, super excited to be here. Um, so this was about 2003 or so, and we have, um, we're a fully public high school, part of Highline Public Schools. Um, and we have a, what we call a skill center. And the principal at the time really noticed this need for, um, or this desire for students who had a passion for aviation. And when you're surrounded by companies such as Boeing and Alaska Airlines, a major international airport, King County Airport, um, you know, the, the, the passion was there and the resources were there. So Aviation High School was begun in 2003 because of that spark, that need for uh, something focused for all of those students um, with that passion. So we grew um, into a school of 400 students. We're a small choice high school. Students can um, put in their application. We're fully um, lottery. So any student who has that desire um, can join. We um, received a tremendous support from the aviation community and were able to build our own building in 2013-14. Um, and it's located on the Museum of Flight. Um, uh, so that's a, a huge stakeholder of ours, which again, we'll hear about in a little bit, but um, we, you know, 400 students on a, a small school of choice, uh, fully public, it's really awesome. Therese, thanks for sharing that. I'm so glad to have you and, and the rest of the panelists here and to the, to the attendees as well. You know, you mentioned some there, Tracy, you talk about the focus on aviation and also listening to Tim and Craig talk about the types of, we call them strands, but the kind of maybe the disciplines or the type of subjects that you focus on and how that's reflective of the 
of the community you have and how important it is. Anyone want to elaborate on that? Because I know in, in one of the beauties of these kind of models, I think, is that we can tailor them to the needs of the community. And clearly, I think you guys have. Can you speak to that approach? Are there certain stakeholders you have to, to tap into? What helps you identify what areas of focus that you have? And anyone would like to speak of the panel? So I can tell. Oh, go ahead, oh, go ahead, Teresa, and then I'll follow you. Go ahead. Well, I was going to start because people, when you think of aviation, you're, you're thinking of pilots and engineers, but we have a tagline, which is aviation is everywhere. Uh, when you have a major um, um, community partner like Alaska Airlines, they have a marketing business and marketing, they have finance, they have legal, um, they have HR. So it's not just about the uh, pilots or engineers. So for those of you who are looking for, um, you know, that kind of beginning force is you find maybe a community partner, whether you're a small community, you know, or a large um, urban area like Seattle, and um, and look, look to all of the different strands that they have. So in our science department, we have our physics and physics of flight, but we also in our biology department um, are doing great things with environmental studies, the environmental impact, bio health. We have students who say, you know, I wanna be a nurse or a doctor. I wanna go into medical, perfect you know, that we can make those connections for those students just by that, you know, that aviation is everywhere. There's you know, multiple career strands um, and professions that hence the profession-based learning um, that, that aviation supports. Yeah, and similarly, what we look at are student desires, what do they want to do, but also uh, the needs of the region, not just the city that we're located in, but uh, regional, you know, needs as far as employment, et cetera. So we rely heavily on our business and industry partners, particularly because each pathway has a business and industry advisory committee. So they give us a lot of information about what needs are in the community. And so we go both with that and with student needs and how we can best support both. Well said, Tim. Greg. Yeah, I um, kind of echo what Tim said. We, we kind of predicated our growth. Um, our first two were set, global food, sustainability, and then uh, global business. Business is the second largest major in our state um, at our UW uh, public system of colleges, um, and then nursing's right there. So we're a farming community. And that is originally what Sun Prairie was. Sun Prairie was under 15,000 people a couple of years ago. Now we're into that 35 and growing phase. So we're a farming community. Um, at our core. So that's where the global food sustainability came in. And then when we went to open a new one, my straw poll took like five minutes and it was anything medical, like from counseling to the student survey, to the principals, to the community, it was all medical, medical, medical. And that biomedical where we're offering the layers one year, two year, anything in within that field that there's shortages. And we're located a stone's throw away from Madison. So between the UW, the Dean, Epic over in Verona is a 25 minute ride. Medical for us was a no brainer um, and, and kind of grew from there. And then our new high schools wanted to add two banks. And I'm like, well, when did the last time anyone went to a bank, right? I mean, who goes to banks? So we have apps for that. Anyway, uh, so then it was, we need financial districts. Learn, teach kids about the parent plus loan for college. Let them understand what an unsubsidized loan is. So more of a grander look at that piece of it. We teach them money 101 within our district, but now we want that capstone level. So they're going to run our financial districts at our new school. So some of them came on need kind of out of what the school was building and we could do to help educate our students on life skills. And then the other came just with that flourish. And so those are the next two for us rolling out in 2022. That's great to hear. And uh, all these stories are so indicative of Richard Sheridan's coming about running the experiment, right? Let's go do these things. Let's run and see what, what takes hold. And Teresa, your comment about, even though you're focused on aviation, the value chains, the supply chains associated with almost any industry, right, plays into so much of, of, uh, of fodder for what, what kind of topics we can bring in. And I think one of you mentioned, it may have been Tim, student interest, right? We don't want to forget that the focus is on the students here. We're trying to tap into that passion. So for those that are on the line thinking about starting a program, or maybe in the midst of that, uh, a couple of things there that we heard from the panelists so far, really good points to have. One I'll make mention of, and perhaps others like to elaborate here, 
Uh, and I also invite uh, folks on the line to start adding uh, questions here. But you mentioned uh, an advisory board, uh, a group of people in the community that you pulled together to talk with. You want to ex uh, explain uh, to the uh, to the attendees uh, how you set those up, how you uh, you uh, uh, feel the people that you've selected for that. And I'm assuming it, uh, as you mentioned, it kind of along the lines of maybe some of the strands you've had. But you care to talk about that, Pam? Sure, I can go ahead and address that. So what we do is we actually uh, send out uh, letters to people that we think might be interested. And of course, that works both ways. There are people that actually come to us and say, how can I help? And of course, one of the first things we say, well, would you like to serve on our advisory board? <laughs> and that usually works, uh, particularly if they have a specific interest. But it's, it's just a matter of getting to know the people in your community. And one of the big things for me that has been helpful is serving on uh, a couple of you know, community organizations so that you really get to know the community. You have to be out there so that people know who you are, what you're about, and what you're trying to do for the students and the community. So uh, we invite people that are showing interest in serving on our advisory board, and it's uh, been very successful. We have large advisory boards for most of our programs, not only at TCOP, but within the, uh, the district itself. Thank you. Oh, I was going to echo that a little bit. Um, really important um, as a small school, you know, we're required for the career and technical education, uh, the state to have an advisory board for our different strands. And we went about it a little bit differently and created because we're a small school, one advisory board for, you know, we have somebody who's um, background is in computer science, somebody who's background in, um, in manufacturing, et cetera. And they've just been instrumental, not only in helping advise um, industry trends, um, employment trends, but also offering their ed ed expertise to our teaching staff. Because like many of you, you might have brand new teachers that come on and hire and don't know a lot about what is PBL, you know, profession-based learning or project-based learning. You know, how, how do I connect? How do I transform this into the classroom? And um, our um, advisory board has just been instrumental in helping them look at problems of practice and industry trends and translating that into learning experiences for the students. Such an important point. Craig, I don't know if you want to add anything to uh, advisory board. Uh, we built one within house um, right away. It, come in in our YAP coordinator, uh, Youth Apprenticeship Program coordinator has uh, very good ties within this uh, community. So bringing all the people that work with all the different employers into the fold, because you don't want to over tap those resources. You don't want them receiving multiple calls about a youth apprenticeship program, about this. And then I was lucky enough that I was able to join the Sun Prairie Chamber of Commerce as a board member, um, which has really helped me um, get into the community full, work with our business partners uh, a little bit more. Um, just real quick, if I can just address something in the chat um, from Jana Sprinkle. Uh, I'm from a small town. I'm a, I'm a small town person. I've thought about this, like, what's the size in Southwest Wisconsin? It'd be a lot harder to pull off. We're talking rural farming communities, really small schools. We've been shown a path where we can get our hands on business partnerships anywhere we want these days, right? And we can zoom those students and those people in. So it's awesome that you're starting with a local business. That's what we want to do too. Build your brand within your community. Let the community know, let parents know, let the board members know that you're helping your community first because you're offering free internships, right? For them, because so many people lost their interns this COVID that people are a little bit behind on some of those projects that they might not have time for. It's great to help your community, but as you start to grow or look for partnerships, we have that Zoom world now where people are willing to pull into meetings and do things a little bit faster. And so I think it's great. Uh, I'm born and raised in Iowa. I had to look up where Orange City was and I see Cedar Falls that I know. So you're talking big and small, even where I'm from, the collaboration you can have in working. And there is not a partner alive that wouldn't take two people, two groups working the same project. Well, oh no, I got too much information about my company now. Like, you know what I mean? So those piggybacking relationships are there. Um, but I think it's awesome you're starting in a small community because all, all of our students deserve this experience. And as a small town person, those things weren't always there. When you get to college, you hear a big city people, the internship they had in high school. I'm like, what, quick trip? Like, where would you go, you know? <laughs> so it's having those different opportunities. I think that's, that's awesome, Dana. 
Yeah, I want to follow up with that, Greg. Last year, we had the opportunity for some of our web and digital communication students to serve internships uh, working with a seminary in Ethiopia, uh, just because, you know, they're able to do that now. And so, you know, it's, it's simply amazing what, what is available to students. It's just a matter of getting out there and letting people know that this is what we have, this is what we can do for you. It eventually comes out to being a win-win situation for both the, the companies and the students. If you have a, a chamber of commerce, a rotary club, a local elks club, uh, the uh, any of those you know local business folks that get together and generally they know someone who knows someone who knows someone mm -hmm. and it just it can snowball right from there. Right. Dana, thank for your comment and uh, thanks uh, panel for the response to that. Uh, we keep putting those in there. Those are uh, outstanding comments. You know, you tapped on a couple of things here, uh, maybe want to explore a little bit um, as well as, and that is like start the instructors and then that, that community interfacing. And I know when I first came in, I was a corporate guy uh, for many years, came in. And so I was thinking corporate all the time, but your comments are so cool. There are so many opportunities for students to learn things, interconnect with, with startup companies, right? The entrepreneurial community is such a great community out there that you can tap in. And there are a bunch of folks that, have great ideas and not a lot of resources, right? Again, goes back to Tim's comment, win-win situations can be created by that. Nonprofit organizations, right? They have all the spirit and passion, but don't have any resources at all. All great opportunities for if you're thinking about starting up a program and saying, oh man, how do I connect with the, with the community out there? We're only limited by our imaginations. So uh, great comments all, and I appreciate Jenna's uh, speak. I'm a, I'm a small town boy too. And in our CAPS model, we take great pride in that we run both urban, suburban, and a lot of rural uh, uh, communities. And it's, it's so critical because you're right, as you folks have mentioned, the panels mentioned, it doesn't matter where the kids are coming from, they each deserve this opportunity of learning. So uh, great comments and, and love what Jenna says. Let's speak a little bit about uh, some of the secret sauce, the magic sauce, maybe some of the uh, critical success factors. And been, having been a teacher for six years, I feel like that is such a, a critical element. And many uh, folks on here as attendees may be instructors. Uh, panelists, what comments would you have about the type of teacher, the type of things that they do? Uh, how do you look for them? How do you connect with them? What are your thoughts along those lines? Hmm. You say that again, Greg. Sorry, I was reading the chat. One more yeah, time. No, no worries. I'm glad you're paying attention to that. So from the instructor level, you're building your programs. Uh, what, what did you approach that as like, what kind of instructors you look for? What kind of experiences they had? You know, this is a little bit different, uh, in many ways, extremely different from what we might have say traditional education. And as I went back to college uh, in the middle of my uh, life and learned uh, education for two years, what I did was nothing like what they kind of talked about. So that's kind of, how do you find your teachers? How do you kind of build that type of, uh, of experience that provides these experiences for the kids? I know when we're searching um, for new staff, especially, and then of course, you know, just continuing uh, learning for our adults on campus that we have now is, that willingness to take a risk um, and willingness to model to students what it means to uh, take a risk, fail, try again, maybe try two or three or four times, um, but that they're in that, that space together um, and that that's all part of um, their future and um, their um, you know, commitment to excellence is, is being willing to try new things. And if that doesn't work, try something different. Um, and so we want our teachers to have that spirit of inquiry, that spirit of taking risks, um, the spirit of modeling to students and being partners with them in their learning. I think not only with doing that with students, but also not being afraid to go out into the community and say, mm -hmm. uh, this is what I'm doing. How can you help or how can we help you? I think you have to have teachers that are willing to make the ask because let's face it, if you have somebody that just sits back and waits for the community to come to them, not a lot's gonna get accomplished. You've gotta be you know, confident in yourself, confident enough to say, this is what I need, how can you help me? And then vice versa. Uh, I'll be honest, I, I honestly believe, so I'm kind of like Greg in this, this is my uh, entering my, third year 
uh, as a high school teacher, I spent 17 at higher education. Um, so I, I found in studying it and working with launch out of Elmbrook and Dr. Hall, your young teachers want involvement. They like teaching with other teachers still, right? They're used to that collaboration and some of that. And then your older teachers that are looking for a re-spark. And for some of them, your, your good teachers that have been around, they're looking to stir the fire a little bit. They're looking to try something new and re-energize themselves and, and start a new way of doing something. I've kind of fallen in love with the bookends of teachers, the new teachers that can mold themselves into this experiential learning world and the teachers that are want to change, want to rebrand themselves, want that spark for the the last 10 to 15 of their education lives because we know how how this thing feels 25 years in, right? So kind of rebrand themselves and, and go from there. Some of those teachers want that that rebirth, that re-spark, and that's where we're finding some of our successes. Yeah, and I think we have the, the best of both worlds because we have the young teachers and those teachers, like you say, that have been in for a while. And what's really neat is when they start working together and integrating their programs, then it really becomes powerful. Totally agree, Tim. Great comments. Uh, the and then another is folks that are, uh, you know, maybe considering these programs or starting one, mm -hmm. uh, some great thoughts about instructors. And uh, I know I felt, especially when I was coming into a, a industry and a profession that I was kind of unsure about, my first thought was, oh my gosh, if I do something wrong, I'm going to ruin this kid's life, right? Well, mm -hmm. it's, it's not true. I mean, I think it's that the very fact that you're experimenting and trying something, there's a degree of engagement they're going to gain from that. They're going to learn from that. And as many of you mentioned, right, I mean, we learn from the failures and the mistakes. And uh, so if you're an instructor thinking about this or you're looking to get instructors, I like what, in fact, you even say it uh, culturally, that Trace mentioned, is some risk takers, right, that are willing to take a risk, knowing that the, the outcome may not be, you know, exact that first time, but both will learn from that. Both the student and the teacher will learn from that. And I know in the CAPS model, we speak about a joint journey between the student and the instructor, right? And we're having some great dialogue, we're having great thoughts, but it comes down to something changing in the classroom. And the instructor is so key to that. And to the, ex uh, the extent that we as leaders can make them feel comfortable in trying things, make them feel comfortable that, look, this may fail and flop on its face, you know, go try again. That I think is extremely uh, key. And that, that's true of any industry, right? That they need, we need to uh, rehearse that and practice uh, the idea of, of making mistakes and learning from them. But I think uh, as I came in this industry, uh, we seem to be at least initially apprehensive at risk taking. Again, my my perspective was I was afraid, you know, what impact it might have kids, and learned very quickly that, you know, they had as much fun in the failure as I did, and and uh, we learned from that. So great comments, all. And Fail forward, comments. Greg. Yeah, please Fail go ahead. forward. Right. Fail forward. What Dr. Sherry right. just told us. Man, I love that. Fail forward is a thing now. Fail forward. Is it? I love That's it. True. Right? It doesn't epitomize what we're trying to do. Fail forward. Like it is. You it is so powerful. So powerful. Just real quick, what Diana asked in the chat, I'll be candid with you. Obviously, I'm a candid person, but it how much you want to grow, how many strands to me and uh, Teresa and Tim can touch it depends on your district, right? It depends on your FTE. It depends on how much they're gonna to correlate to your numbers, to the success of it. It's about getting project partners and mentors. There's a lot of moving parts, especially early. So the quote that I think Corey put in there, dream big, start small. I wanted to roll out more because I come from the, the sports world where if you're not growing, marketing 101, right? You're not growing, you're dying. So in my head, I'm like, we got to add more strands. I just don't want to sit here for another year with just two. I want more. Well, now we're up to adding three. We're only going to add two, but the pitch and the movement says three. So now I get three in a year. So it, it's a slow grow and you have to play that game within the game. Um, so just, it's honestly a matter of assessing your district, your connections, the money involved and what you feel your numbers can be in order to show success early. I would rather be successful small than under successful big and just keep promising more, I'd rather over deliver early, especially selling it to a school district personally. Great, Craig, I don't know if Tim uh, or Therese want to add to that, great, great comments. And I appreciate Diana, your question there about strands, great advice. Yeah, and that, yeah, that is really, really true because um, 
kids will come up with the best. I mean, the students are the best, like we should have this class or we, you know, we would, you know, this would be really interesting. And it's like, okay, that's great. But what are we going to give up to add that? And Craig made a really good point. Um, you know, it depends also on your structure. If you're a private school or a, a charter school or a public school and, you know, one of the downfalls as far as being a public school is, you know, we're so tied to that FTE and the funding model and, um, you know, certification requirements. Uh, so uh, we've become really creative in, you know, if we have several strands that we may be able to even kind of meld. So our next big project is trying to figure out how we can do some dual crediting. So our geometry teacher also teaches our CAD program, for example. Well, they're very, I mean, why not use CAD to, you know, in geometry modeling and, you know, building things. So you're doing real world work. Um, and so that, you know, then the roadblock becomes, well, you can't get credit for both in only one period, you know, so we're, we're working on trying to create some, some fun things that way. But yeah, definitely looking at those barriers and trying to figure out, you know, what staying true to your mission and your, you know, the, the culture and soul of your school. I saw a lot of nodding heads when we talked about FTEs, right? Both <laughs> the cringe and the, oh yeah, that's that's the world we live in. But, you know, being an economist, right? I mean, that's part of our job is we're trying to make the most out of limited resources. So I appreciate that question and that, you know, live within those resources you have and and success begets success, right? I mean, this, we've seen this. We're You're at a point now where, where 12 years ago when CAP started, another program started, you know, uh, it was kind of unknown. There was a territory that wasn't a lot written about this. Now there are a lot more successes. We've mentioned, you know, within just CAPS alone, uh, 76 programs out there of varying degrees and sizes. So we have a lot of, of examples out there that we can point to of very different configurations. The, the beauty of, I think, approaching this is that there isn't one way to go do it. I mean, we in CAPS have uh, five core values. Our framework is based on that. And if you meet those, how you meet those is yours to design and do. And if you're doing a one strand or, or 15 strands, it's those same five. So uh, scaling that way, starting at that scale and growing as success begets it is a very fine approach that anyone uh, can feel good about. I'm gonna uh, pick on one of the uh, uh, comments here. Uh, Jack Buckley, if I read your name right, my eyesight's getting, uh, this is very small print. Uh, Jack, you're welcome to uh, go off mute if you'd like to ask your question. You're talking about community partnerships also in smaller communities. Uh, would you care to ask your question out loud? Yeah, sure. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Greg. Um, just in terms of outreach and building partners um, in the spirit of everything that was just said in the last 15, 20 minutes, what if you're on the outside, the small community partner? So we're engaged in some primarily summertime authentic um, experiential research on the coast. <laughs> but um, we're often on the outside trying to move the district to make some of the changes that people are speaking about. So my question would be, what advice do, do those of you have, do the panelists have for community partners who are willing and looking for a dance partner from the district? Great question, Jack, and great to connect with you again. I remember meeting you in, in Boston a few years ago. So, so glad to have you here, buddy. Thanks. Thoughts panelists, uh, great. They have a great program there. I don't know if you want to elaborate, Jack, but I know focus very much on, on the Marine uh, community, I think, uh, there in that area. And just incredible programs that are not within the school, but outside of it. But how do you get, how do you partner with school districts? So obviously uh, we are part of school districts. And we are also, though, we depend on a lot of either partners or sometimes even intermediaries is a term I use that aren't quite involved that are, are part of that process. Thoughts or comments on those kind of partnerships and how, uh, how you might make it easier to engage with, uh, with people like us or our districts? So Jack, let me, let me take a shot at this. My understanding is that you're a, a district that's trying to get uh, recognition or program that's trying to get recognition from your district, is that correct? Or other districts? Um, 
I, I, I would say both. So um, we just tried, try to give you a little bit of context for answering the question that I, that I pose. <clears throat> um, we have students from our surrounding time, towns, mm -hmm. so it's probably three, di three different districts um, doing summertime research with us, um, water quality, coastal investigation, salt marsh vegetation studies, those, those kinds of things that are kind of traditional uh, watershed investigations or staple um, activities and that lots of communities um, engage kids in. But anyways, how do you, from that perspective, try to get um, the schools to be more engaged in getting students involved in those programs so that you actually build the synergy. So kids get credit, so to speak, when they're with you in the summer and the summertime becomes part of the, uh, um, the district's um, curriculum, if you will. So how do you build those relationships if you're the community partner on the outside looking for um, some synergy with those on the inside? Uh, it's communication, communication, communication. So uh, when we first opened TCALC, it was uh, strictly for students in our particular Topeka Public Schools District. Uh, now it's open to all students in the county, Shawnee County. But that didn't happen overnight. It was a matter of letting people know, first of all, what we do and how their students can be successful and how our program can help them. So. Uh, it was a lot of meetings, uh, sitting down, talking to folks in the other districts in the county and convincing those superintendents that, you know, this is a positive. So I think it's sort of a corollary to what you're talking about is just a matter of that communication, which may take some time to convince people that, uh, you know, this is a positive. But eventually people come around because they see the, the value in what we do. I'll add on to that. Um, we have um, um, the career and technical education that it's called work work based learning or work site learning credits, um, and I think Jack, you were mentioning that those students can earn credit over the summer. Uh, so it might just start with um, finding that partner at um, those schools that you're working with now to also help be your voice in reaching somebody at the district level. Um, because when, when we mentioned what the money that our district would be making through the state's work-based learning program, because we get funding for all of those, it kind of perked some ears up and said, okay, if some uh, money involved um, and our state is providing that, then um, how do we expand that? So sometimes like, um, um, you know, Tim said it's just con continuing to push and push and then taking it from the small and growing it. Uh, it also Joey, thank you. Go ahead, Craig. I'll, I'm sorry, go ahead, Craig, you have something. To say. No, Tim, please follow up, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say that it also helps to be able to connect with the counselors from the different uh, school districts as well because they really have that uh, experience where they can talk with the students and with their uh, district leaders about the importance of the, of the work that we do, work that you do. Uh, Joey, thank you for posting Jack's site and it's really cool. So Jack, I understand that you do the work. Your organization does the work. This is gonna be no cost to the district. Right. You're literally just opening your doors to a school district. Correct. Right. Okay. I, I don't know why people wouldn't jump in. Like, do you want to you want to partner with us? Like, I, what do you need from me, Jack? You know, like, because that's awesome. I just went through your site, Joey. Thank you for posting that. But I, I think everything they said is right. At the end of the day, now you're recruiting, right? So there's got to be some school board member, some innovative director like I have that that became the person that is helping me grow, right? And not everyone at the district level is automatically on board, right? They they're not against it, but do we need it? Is there enough money for it? Right. All that pushback is going to come. It's really a matter of finding that person that understands what you want to do, finding that bio teacher, science teacher that can come over, collaborate, give up some of their time to get that word of mouth going. But I would try to find that person and, and see if they will start bridging that gap for the two of you um, to, to get into a district, especially if you're representing multiple schools um you need one to fall 
And as soon as someone else is getting credit, if my son or daughter is getting credit over here or not over here, and someone's getting credit over here, well, that's going to make me raise a flag. So I don't know if you have to go after all of them at once, but between your multiple schools, somebody has to believe in this as much as you do and as much as we do. We're looking at it. Uh, it's just a matter of finding that person that's willing to be your liaison, be your voice in, you know, the, the Hamilton. I want to be in the room where it happens, right? You need someone in the room where it happens. Um, so try to find that person that's going to be the voice for, for your program in that room. You only need one voice that, that can start just making people, well, what's this? It's free. Why aren't we doing something that, that's already being ran well? Um, and the other thing that goes so far is student voice, student opinion broadcasting that let your students say what they got from it show them they're the experiences that they're getting because well i want my son or daughter to have that experience and then from there it, it can create but i would really push student stories on social media um, within those districts within local papers push student stories make it a swell well great thanks for all those um pieces of information and advice i really appreciate it thank you Jack, we welcome your question and glad to connect with you again, my friend, and all the great work you're doing there. Some other good comments in the chat room too, uh, Jack, from uh, uh, Suzanne Hall, uh, one of our new uh, members down in the Joplin area, just starting up a program. And Laura Harsh, a longtime friend, uh, also with the Shawnee Mission uh, uh, School District, uh, speak, you know, echoed many of the comments here about, about champions. Uh, the one thing I, I've always tried to do, and, and it's really the beauty of our industry, right, is that no matter what, we're different places, we're all in violent agreement when it comes to the outcomes of the students. And if we can show and demonstrate how that student is better off and it leads to something that's gonna be personal for them, and, and clearly a lot of what the CAPS is focused on, something career-related, they're able to make decisions that's, that lead to where they might wanna to go to school, whatever their next post-secondary thing is. And it eventually it leads in a uh, a fulfilling career that not only they're just economically compensated, but they're doing something they love. And if we can show those examples, uh, and I think that wins a lot of hearts. So that's always an approach I've tried to take. And I know the panelists here and others have, have uh, echoed that. Uh, one theme here we've kind of uh, talked about is the importance of, of uh, post-secondary credit. And I think all of the programs have built those in. So uh, I just make that statement, but ask the panel to add into it. I know that uh, we in Blue Valley, where I was teaching, and now very much across the caps, is as we survey kids that have, have graduated, we ask them, what were the value drivers of, of your experience? And they talk about the hands-on, they talk about resume-worthy experiences, but they always talk about how it also led to some college credit. That's still a huge driver. And clearly, and, uh, when costs are extremely high, those uh, those expenses are growing. To be able to achieve that is is not just an added bonus, but almost uh, you know a, a price of being in the game. And any other comments, uh, panelists, you'd like to add to that? As people are designing their programs, making sure you have strong relationships with the post secondary institutions that are around you, not just colleges and universities, although those are the primary ones. Um, any comments you'd like to make about that as a critical success factor in starting a program? I, I would just echo what you said, Greg. Make sure that you're aware of what's available in your community as far as you know post-secondary education and how you can work with those uh, institutions. As, you know, as far as college credit, um, we're lucky here in Topeka that we have Washburn University, Washburn Tech, and of course there are other community colleges in the area where our students are able to take advantage of courses and. The nice thing about some of them is that, that it's no cost to the students. So again, we're very fortunate. Yeah, I'd yeah, say uh, primarily ours is through Madison Technical College. Um, we're dual credit, but then it transfers, like I said, to the UW system of schools. And, mm -hmm. and like anywhere when you're transferring credits, there's gonna be a registrar somewhere that's gonna and look at something if it's out of the area. So one, knowing where those credits are gonna go like any dual credit class in your district. Um, but I, I would build with. So we have AP courses that would testing allow you for that college credit build in, but moving forward with our biomedical, I am building, we are, we are my, the, the main teacher and I are building with MATC. So we are building with some of their credentials as we are setting up our curriculum within our district. So it matches MATC. 
um, just in some of those initial credits for that one year degree they have uh, within that biomedical field. So build it with those dual credits um, to the best of your ability. It is really tough to do it in retrospect, right? To go back and, okay, now you need this, you don't have this in order for that to count, we're gonna need you to do this. It's build it properly, build it slowly, build it smartly. And if you can couple that with really good uh, internship or work-based learning experiences, it's really great for the students. Thank you, team. Uh, another a very important critical success factor as expressed by our students, our customers. I'm going to uh, reach out to a buddy of mine. I know it's on uh, Danny Fisher. I kind of warned him I, I might pick on him. Uh, Danny has been with uh, a couple of programs uh, that I've gotten to know. Uh, was with the CAPS program in uh, in Utah. Uh, but Danny, if you're on, if you'd mind jumping on, I know you've explored and gone through a startup phase in several locations. Any words of wisdom that you'd like to share uh, from your perspective and your experiences that you've had? Catching him cold, so he... He's either struggling to get off mute or has walked away. I think I'm going to get back to Danny. He's a great, uh, great individual, great leader um, in the Arizona area. Let me pick on another uh, new best friend of mine, uh, David Day with uh, Oklahoma, one of the great communities I get to, to go through uh, as my travels down to Dallas. Uh, gotten to know the community a little bit, gotten to know David. Uh, uh, David is in that exploratory phase. They have some great, and David, I hope you elaborate on your community. Uh, and one of the cool things you have going on, both in your business community and the industrial uh, base that you have there, but also the great programs you have going on, the connections. Any thoughts you'd like to share with uh, everyone here? Well, I'm just kind of learning as we go and trying to soak in them up as much as I can. We have, we're a, we're kind of a, I would say not a large school, but a, a larger school in the state of Oklahoma. We're 10 minutes away from Mid America Industrial Park, which is the fourth largest industrial park in the nation. Um, Google sits in our industrial park. Uh, we have 81 companies. Um, and recently, my superintendent, who's now left but uh, retired, but we just opened up the Innovation Center. We have a Rogers State University prior campus, it's a satellite campus. And so we are kind of taking over some classroom space here. I'm sitting in here right now at Rogers State University. Uh, we have a manufacturing program currently, an EMT program currently. We have an engineering program through SREB. We have a robotics and an esports will all be housed out here. And then we're also looking at doing our aviation program out here as well. Right now it's currently at our high school, but we would like to initially move it out here. Um, we're going to look at Tango Flight as a fourth year piece of our aviation program where the students will actually build a plane. Uh, and then we're partnering with a local airport to provide um, uh, flight instruction for our students as well. So we've got a lot of things going on, but I love the program's guidelines and how you do things. We're just looking and exploring it and taking it from there. And I'm just trying to soak up as much as I can right now, to be honest. David, we're glad to have you. If there's any questions of this panel, feel free to jump on. Um, I have taken a lot of notes. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. That's what. That's exactly what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and and Dr. Suzanne Hall knows I'm I'm coming. You're like right below uh, Dan. We've been working uh, every week here, and and just a great job in uh, Joplin, Missouri. I tell you, uh, and, and just to give a little context to the approach that they had. Uh, also, I think the initial discussions, if I'm not wrong, Suzanne, actually were through the Chamber of Commerce, a very engaged Chamber of Commerce there. Uh, Joplin is very much a, a cohesive community, uh, very focused on, on trying to grow, focused on becoming an innovation hub for the area. And some of our initial uh, discussions were that and a neighboring, uh, a neighboring program in Yosho that they had learned about. And uh, Suzanne, who's actually with uh, the university there in Joplin, uh, they've joined us and actually a uh, unique design coming from the university into the school districts, uh, speaking about some of the, the uh, things that Jack was uh, talking about, uh, partnerships that go across uh, different intermediaries. Uh, Suzanne is, is taking those uh, 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 right on. So, Suzanne, you mind jumping on and sharing some of your early thoughts of, you know, your approach to as you explored things and started in some of the discussions we've had? 
Sure, I would love to. Um, so I, I've known about CAP since March 1st, actually January. We had our first Zoom meeting about it in January. Um, I didn't realize I was going to be the new director for Missouri Southern State University's CAPS program, but we are the first university in the country to be the lead with the CAPS program, and we are partnering with our local school districts. Um, we have three districts that we're starting with, uh, Joplin, um, that Greg mentioned, Webb City, and Carl Junction. Um, Joplin has about 8,000 students. Web City has around 4,500 students total. And Carl Junction is a smaller district with about 2,500 to 3,000 students. Um, we also have a plethora of districts around us that are very interested in joining our um, new venture. But um, this year, I am in the process of just um, getting our program built. Um, everything will be dual credit. Um, one thing that I started, I reached out to Corey and I had asked him, do you actually have a list of every CAPS program in the state of Missouri and the charges affiliated, you know, per student? And he didn't. And so I am completing that list this week. Um, I started one. So if you don't have one in your state, you should really think about doing that. I'm a retired assistant superintendent. And so I'm all about focus and da 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 da, da. So anyway, um, it's all about the budget. Um, I currently don't have a budget, um, but I will have a budget, hopefully by this time next year. So um, anyway, but I'm meeting with our superintendents um, next week that we are gonna be partnering with. Um, everybody's very excited about the program. We're gonna start with, um, we were gonna start with two strands. I think we're gonna start with three strands. And I just, um, the president of the university and I just finished a grant application um, couple weeks ago. And so we've got our fingers crossed that we will also have that funding coming as well. So. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, let me uh, jump to one of our uh, comments I had kind of uh, missed there. I'm glad uh, someone reached out to me. Uh, Kara Martin, who's uh, actually associated with Wolf Springs Elementary, would add some comments about uh, career immersion. You mind, Kara, join us, uh, Kara, and speak to that? Sure. I'm Kara Martin. I am um, a teacher at Wolf Springs, which is in the Kansas City area. Um, we're a relatively new school. When we opened our building, we were so very inspired by CAPS and um, the passion and I guess just the ownership that they give to their learners. And so we knew that that was something we wanted to integrate into our learning experience for our older students to begin. And so um, we began very simply just trying to look around our city and the resources that we had around us. Um, we are very lucky to have Garmin, Burns and McDonald, um, lots of great STEM related businesses. And so that was our jumping off point. Um, we planned an immersion day in conjunction with CAPS and students were able to have just a little uh, taste test of lots of different professional immersion areas. And they went back to school and did some research. They went through an interview process, which was an amazing learning opportunity for them. We talked a lot about eye contact and handshakes and those professional skills that are very important. Um, I was gonna say as an adult, but clearly they're important before then. Um, and so based on their interest, they were placed in a cohort. And our first year, uh, we were able to give an hour a week for those cohorts. We had this huge ceremony. And remember, these are fourth and fifth graders. So uh, pizzazz matters, right? And so we wanted to have, um, I guess I can liken it to like a Harry Potter sorting ceremony. They came up in the gym and we had music pump in and lights were going and it was really exciting. Um, they put their hand on this electric kind of current ball and then boom, their cohort flashed up on the screen. And it was one of the most memorable things that I've been a part of as a teacher. And every year that's continued to grow. Um, we focused on, like I said, a lot of STEM areas. So we had agriculture and architecture, digital media, um, coding and robotics, um, medical studies, entrepreneurship was a new one that we added this last year. And so obviously there's a lot of growing as we you know, continue to roll that out. And no year has been like the one before. Um, with all of the COVID related um, protocols that we had to abide by last year, we couldn't mix groups like we did in years past. And so we thought, well, what do we have in place that we can kind of modify? 
we across our building do um, several STEM days, like STEM immersion days. And what a perfect way to integrate those professional studies into STEM because that is real life, right? It's no, no, it's no longer just doing an experiment. It's seeing who does that experiment in real life. And hey, I could do that. And so it's, um, like I said, it has been a huge growing opportunity. Um, but as a teacher and thinking back to Richard this morning with his balloon analogy, you know, like we're flying the balloon. And so it's really awesome to see how kids have responded at the end of every fourth and fifth grade year, those kids rave about those experiences and they're rigorous, you know, they're not just fluff. And so I cannot wait to see those grades um, of students grow and mature and just to see how maybe that one hour a week has um, helped to mold them um, or even at the bare minimum just grow their own self-awareness and their interests and what they have to offer to the world. So that's a little bit about what we've been doing at Wolf Springs. Carrie, thank you so much and you know so much of our discussion uh, is focused at professional development in the high school years when it's, you know, we're actually seeing specialization. I mean, jobs are specialized, so there are a lot of technical things associated with that. But a couple of things I think Kara does a great job of showing. Number one is things like doing research, which has been a probably a key type of skill that we've tried to develop at the high school level to be able to introduce that concept at what we might say very early ages. Think of the benefits that's gonna provide as those students continue to mature and develop those skills by the time I say as a high school teacher, I get them, they're gonna be so much farther down the road and I can take them either farther, right? So a great uh, point being made there. And just awareness, there are a lot of good discussion and models uh, out there as well as uh, each of the programs here, I'm sure, are doing some kind of, of career awareness that even in those early years that we have devoted to the development of literacies, which are absolutely critical, right? That are, are languages that are gonna need uh, be needed no matter what the discipline is, um, that we are, are exposing them to thoughts and ideas that eventually lead to uh, finding passions that leads to careers. So I greatly appreciate you sharing uh, your great story and all the cool things you're be do, uh, doing as well. I don't know if the panelists would like to add or comment on that as well. No, I would just, I think that's great, Kara. Do you do any work with the uh, KC STEM Alliance? So, that's one resource that we've used. Um, we really try to focus on professional um, professional connections. And that was one way that we were able to work those in. Um, like I said, we're in Kansas City, we're in the Kansas City area. And so we have so many amazing resources, um, but we utilized field trips to get our kids out into the community. And it was, it was amazing. Right. You know, I think it's wonderful. One of the things that I was able to do uh, when I was in the Kansas City area at another district was have the middle school students uh, actually do some of their work in math at a local engineering firm. And that was really a fantastic opportunity for those students. They actually went in and the projects were designed for them by engineers. They worked on the projects, solved the problems, and the engineers came in and, and uh, quotes graded them, but it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. So I think the younger that you can get students involved, the better. 100%. I saying that very young kids, kindergarten, first graders, cannot have a very meaningful experience with that. And it's been so much fun to see how we can take these huge successes that CAPS has had and bring them down to such a young age level um, with a lot of success, we think. Great comments. You know, um, I had the pleasure of speaking uh, to a, of all groups, a preschool, instead of preschool teachers. And they were, uh, the topic was, hey, gosh, my gosh, we read that, you know, jobs are becoming more technical, you know, AI is going to make things more quantitative. What do we need to be, you know, doing to get our kids, you know, ready for that? And I thought it was a great topic, was absolutely surprised that at a, at a you know, uh, preschool type environment and a, and a kindergarten environment, they're asking that question. I, in turn, in reflecting on Kara's comments here, I want to learn how, how do we keep high school cool again, like all the cool things that you do. So what a great exchange is that I think that don't get too separated from uh, the uh, our, our, our pathways, our channel, if you will, 
that we can learn from each other and, and we actually need to build from each other. So greatly appreciate uh, Kara uh, sharing that with us. Uh, we got about 15 minutes here. I invite others to uh, add other questions. I want to explore a theme that Richard kind of set up a little bit. I'm gonna invite my good friend, uh, Joe Whalen. Uh, Joe is uh, one of our esteemed uh, teachers here in Blue Valley. And Joe was here when Blue Valley got started. I think we're approaching what the 12th year now, Joe, if I'm not mistaken, of success. And the reason I've asked Joe to speak about this is that he has seen this evolution of, of as a business guy, I would say is a, a bootstrapping startup, right? He's like, okay, we're gonna do this and we really know what the hell we're really doing, but we're gonna go do it anyway. To the point of some degree of maturity, and I say this with great uh, love and affection for startups, uh, you've done that. Joe, can you mind you. reflecting on, and then I'd love to hear from the panelist perspective too, you know, Richard spoke about culture, kind of reflect on how you saw culture get started, how it got built, and how that is so critical, another critical success factor to uh, starting and maintaining a solid program. No, absolutely. And I, I love the way Richard put that, just run the experiment, because if you don't, from the moment we open our doors, I've been with the program since we built the building in 2010. And pretty much it was all about just building the airplane in mid-flight and just trying new things. And then that was the that was the excitement about being there every day. And the students could sense that excitement. And I think that they, you know, the students know that we're, we're trying things. And in fact, that's, you know, what's one thing the students have shared with me is that the, you know, it's, it's never gets stale. It's, no, it's always a fresh experience and so always trying new things and so we've gone through a few different iterations you know, our, our first year or two it was just trying to figure out what the heck are we doing here what's the you know why are you know why you know what's our purpose here but we did know that across the board even though we all had our own curricular areas of expertise that we wanted to have a multidisciplinary experience where the students aren't just shut up in one classroom in fact that our building was designed to promote this sort of cross collaborative um, experiences with each other and so really that was kind of you know from day one really just building the opportunity for students from dis different disciplines to work on projects and learning from each other and then as we moved along um, then we started to after our, you know we started to expand and work with other school districts within you know other schools within our district as well as then starting to explore a little bit out of our district and it was really all about the keeping you know always doing experiments little experiments trying to keep things constantly changing constantly evolving so now now we're going to i guess we're going into year 13 of the program year 12 of the building and so and it's just always like all right so what is our mission now you know we've you know we've we've you know really i think been able to work our five pillars you know very very successfully always striving but now it's just like all right what is our next thing what is our next mission and so that's that's always the i think that's what keeps it exciting and that's what really makes our culture just a really awesome place to to you know participate in every day thanks joe and you you actually love it I've, I've been fortunate that we're located on the same uh same floor and i get to uh, not only see and observe you but uh, you know you uh, you pull me out of retirement let me uh speak to your class a few times and, and i like your your idea that you know continue to experiment um that we don't get too complacent. What we, we've, we've had great success um, and, and the early years, for those who are just starting a program, you know, you may seem like a struggle, that's okay. I mean, to me, that's what startups are, is that you're struggling, you find out, you know, what's working, not, not what, what's working. And as you mature and kind of get into, you know, comfort zone, don't make it too comfortable that you're not continuing to experiment. And Joe's been a great example of continuing experiment not only just for the classes he uh, helps lead, but helping be a, a leader for us across uh, the whole program at Blue Valley, making sure that we're, we're staying on our toes. I greatly value his, his leadership. Uh, and, and also, I'd say, I just see a couple of uh, questions here in the chat that I, I'd like to address also. Is that Please. Really, this is something that I think all of us who've been here since the beginning would agree is that in the earliest year, you know, the question is, what was the tallest hurdle starting the program and how did you successfully address it? And really, we were so focused on doing with our students what we were going to be doing that we failed to, I think, in some regards to really 
fully embrace the partnership we need to have with our with our traditional high school partners. Um, you know, early on, there was kind of this sense of competition, like, oh, wait, you know, all the students are going to be going to CAPS and not, you know, not engaging in our awesome programming. But so really, then once we realized that started to happen, really is being very intentional on partnering and making sure that all the teachers within the district, not, you know, not just at CAPS and not just at the, you know, high school, but just really understand that, no, we're here to serve, you know, we're here as a service to the entire community, not just our individual students who have signed up for us. So my background's in the molecular research realm. And so we were, you know, we really, you know, we're very intentional about reaching out to the science teachers in the district, letting them know, say, how can we partner with you? What can we do to make this, you know, make our partnership better? So I would say that was probably, at least from a teacher perspective, I'm sure the administrators could probably address other things. But, um, but for me as a teacher, that was the biggest hurdle. And I think that the, and I think the more we then started to address that and be intentional with the partnership, the more that, that hurdle just dropped right down. Yeah, and I would echo that, Joe, and also the fact that uh, people tend to think that uh, your school or your program is well known just because it's out there and it's you know this new thing on the block. Well, that's not necessarily the case. So it's a matter of communication, 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 not only within the school district, but outside of the school district, within the local community. You know, there were times when I thought, well, I was told, well, people already know about TCOP. You know, it's this brand new building. It's fantastic. And, you know, kids are going to flock to it. Well, then you get out in the community and you say, well, you know, I'm the principal of TCOP. Where is that? What's that? What do you do? So, again, it's a matter of communication. Make sure that everyone understands what you do. Early on at Aviation High School, um, there's echo in there. There we go. Um, it, it just getting students to actually want to come, you know, for that same reason, um, as Timothy said, is that communication piece. So just really staying the course and knowing, you know, if you if you believe in what you're doing and you know what's best for students and that you're creating this opportunity, just really staying the course. That was the earliest hurdle. Then once that reputation was built and, and we started actually having um, a waiting list for students to, to get in, we crossed another hurdle when we switched from a very, very intense application process to a, um, an all lottery process and kind of having to, to re-communicate and rebrand what that, that means and why um, our program will still be su successful. Um, which that the first lottery class I think was in six years ago, five or six years ago. And um, you know, we just continued staying that course of, of um, success and um, prove the naysayers wrong, I should say, who um, the, the lottery was a big political um, issue. And um, we've been able to, to continue um, the success that we have because of that foundation that we built. Everyone stay. Um, Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, so for me starting a program and coming in after it was already put into the district. So I came in after this is happening, kids are enrolled. Now you're going to come in, help market it, help get the partnerships. That was the role I took on. And then growing from there. Um, when people are with you, they're not against you, right? So take meetings. We have a huge AVID program in this district. It's awesome, right? First thing I did is meet with the director of Abbott. It was one of my first meetings. How did you grow your program? This is what we're trying to do. This is how I believe we can work together. What advice do you have for me? So lowering your guard, letting people in. People don't want to feel you working from the corners. They want to see what's happening. So bring people into your fold. Don't hide what you're trying to do. Accelerate what you're trying to do through talking to people, through meetings with other programs in your district. Um, meet with your counselors. Let them know what you're doing within your district. Let them know exactly what your program is, what type of students you're looking for, what the academic expectations are. So they're on the same page. And student and staff are your best word of mouth and recruiters. Um, so as we open or talk about new strands, I didn't want it to be, did you hear Excel's opening this or this is happening? No one wants that side. And, and what, again, in the public school setting, when you're worried about FTEs and 
every group is so worried about their part of the branch. If you address everything with what is best for the students, if you're asking yourself that when you go into any meeting, any thought you have, then you know you're coming from the right place. This isn't about defending this exact piece within the district. It's the acceptance of the whole district and how it can grow together. So bringing those different pieces of the puzzle within, even if they're not an advocate for you, you by meeting with them and getting to know them you're trying to stop that they're not against me over here later especially if you're like me and you're brand new to a district um, one of the teachers that we found for our medical strand came from the athletic director when i was meeting with him about our program why athletes are a great fit for something like this just explaining what we do and i see he's like well what's next and i told him biomedical do you know that this coach who's a bi ed teacher at this school was a nurse full-time athletic trainer uh, something tells me that she might be interested in this. So I reached out and then we had other people and case in point from earlier, she was excited to do something new, right? So she's in, in a year. So for her, it's still teaching, but it's just, it's not elementary phi ed, right? She's getting back to older students, teaching something she used to be passionate about and life took her in a different direction. Now she gets to do both, be a teacher and go back to her medical world a little bit. She's Jack. So word of mouth helps those pieces. Don't be secretive. You don't have to show all your cards by any means, right? But you want to be pretty open with this because you're going to need those partnerships, those word of mouth, uh, and to kind of build your brand. Great, great comments, and uh, greatly appreciate the thoughts on on uh, this topic and all the other topics. Uh, this has been tremendous. Uh, we've got a few remaining minutes. What I'd like to maybe do is ask the uh, each panelist to maybe speak in their final thoughts. Is uh, We've talked about disciplines, we talked about strands, jobs are organized because of specialization. And yet uh, one of the major topics that we've had, in fact, it was the theme for our most recent uh, playbook we created was uh, no matter, regardless of the discipline might be graded, there are a set of skills that are critical. And some people call them professional skills, essential skills. I'm not a big fan of the, the soft skill topics. I actually think they're, they're hard skills. Uh, in the final moments we have, I'm going to ask each, uh, each panelist to speak to, and in fact, I would also include the equity, which is a major theme of our playbook, and, and I'm hoping Corey will, will put the, the uh, link for our playbooks in there, you know, certainly in the last years, but, you know, it's gotten attention, but it's been a really issue that we need to achieve a greater degree of, of uh, equity, and that is part of, of, of developing essential skills. Uh, each panelist, you maybe speak to how your program addresses that. And if you'd like any one final last remaining critical success factor, you would uh, advise any person thinking about such a program or starting such a program. So, Tim, can I start with you? Sure, I'll address the last thing first, and that is uh, in terms of starting a program or, you know, doing something with your program. I would say, as Greg knows, I'm an old copper and who became an educator, but um, I would say be aware of your surroundings. Uh, and by that, I mean, know what's going on within your community and within your school district so that you're able to present to folks what you really want to do and what you're all about in terms of your program. Uh, become a real part of the conversation. In terms of our students, what's really important for them is to be able to talk about what they're doing, not only talk about it, but explain their programs and to uh, not be afraid to take risks uh, and also just be able to be good ambassadors, not only for their particular program, but for your school. Tim, thank you. Thanks. Craig, how about yourself? Yeah, Tim, spot on. I, again, I'm an old football coach. So the, the story, John Gruden had a play he loved in the Super Bowl. Brad Johnson, a veteran quarterback, all the way up to their last practice before the Super Bowl, John Gruden was going to run this play. And Brad Johnson didn't like it, didn't want it, but Gruden was going to push it as the coach, right? You're going to run it. You're going to run it. And then it came into the game and he didn't call it because the, the people didn't like it. When we build, it's not about what necessarily we want. It's got to be what your students want, your community wants. You have to know the right play to call based on the information you're getting from your students and your community members. You're building it for your community. You might think it's a great strand or this would be awesome. The people are telling you it's not, it's not, right? So make sure that uh, to me, we represent the students 
and those partners out in the community that need help that are growing and growing it the right way. I wanted medical athletic training. I'm an old coach. I love athletic trainers. There's a shortage. It'd be so easy to do. I don't need a big med area. I need a person helping another person. We can simulate in. I was so excited. The community said, that's not what we want. Our teacher, Jordan Leader, said, that's not what I'm comfortable with. Our students don't want to be athletic trainers. They want that one, two, four nursing degree. My community told me I was wrong. My ego wanted me to be right, but I wasn't. So we have to grow within the community. We represent, right? We're outward facing people. That's why we chose this. We have to be that innovator liaison to help our students. What's best for the students, grow it for them, with them. And, and it's really fun. I'll be honest, it's about them. And then once you see them getting what they want. Um, and as far as growing, we know there's a lot in the curriculum right now as to what needs to be added, what we need to teach we get to write curriculum as we grow our programs. Again, if you are truly outward facing, then your time doesn't matter. So Excel runs Thursday, starting the end of August, we run a free financial presentation where I have the, there's one black owned bank in the entire state of Wisconsin. He's my first presenter. And then we're bringing minorities in banking as the entire speaker series because of the statistics of Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. This is the group that we need to help right? So it's a, it's brought to you by Excel. I'm giving up an hour every three weeks at night to set this up happily. And if that helps grow the program, so be it. But I saw a need in the district that Excel could have a hand in, and the people from the community flooded to be presenters, to be helpers. People want to help, help them find the cause. Um, and I think that's, that's the direction that I'm most comfortable going in a public large school. Love your enthusiasm, Craig. Teresa, uh, you're wrapping us up for us. We only have a couple of minutes, but I uh, love your perspective. You know, somebody hit the nail on the head earlier when they talked about what, what, when you go to your alumni and you say, what made the biggest difference? What made the biggest impact? And we use a singular word all the time is opportunity, creating the opportunity for your students to see themselves in their future. Um, and whatever industry that is in, whether you're in a small community or a large community, creating the opportunity for students for that hands-on, hearts-on, minds-on on learning. Um, when I talk to our alumni, they don't say, oh, it was my AP math class. No, it was, oh my gosh, I had a mentor who was my partner. Oh my gosh, I had that internship at this little small company and all I was doing was data analysis, but it was so cool, you know, to interact in the summer and get paid for it. I had the opportunity to visit college campuses. I had the opportunity to meet with um, industry partners in the classroom. I had the opportunity to hear this guest speaker and all of those things create that excitement and create that passion um, that they can see, students can see themselves in their future. Um, and I think that's what's so important on profession-based learning. Thank you all. Panelists, thank you so much. Uh, attendees, thank you. Great interaction with everyone. Uh, what a great experience. Well, I've, I've learned as well. I've taken many notes myself, uh, David. So thank you all for being here. Please join us on the next session coming up with the, the panel. Thank you all.